Welcome everyone who is already with us. Uh, this is uh, a thematic session on climate neutrality. And in this session, we will discuss the topic of obviously climate neutrality, including zero emission buildings, renewable energy systems in built environment, among other topics. And those are particularly relevant to the Build for People partnership because they cover one of the highlighted challenges of the strategic research and innovation agenda, which is the high carbon and environmental footprint of the built environment and construction. While the aging European built environment suffers from low renovation rates and the large stock of poorly performing buildings and infrastructure, it is also responsible for approximately 40% of energy consumption and 36% of CO2 emissions. It is obvious that the built environment needs a rapid and irreversible transformation aiming to achieve energy efficiency and decarbonization. Hence, it is relevant and important to understand better through the practical examples what needs to be done to decarbonize the EU urban building stock. My name is Aksana Krasatenka. I'm head of knowledge transfer at Eurohit and Power and uh, more specifically at DHC Plus platform set up under the umbrella of Eurohit and Power, which is the European hub for research and innovation in district heating and cooling. I will be moderating this session and my role, apart from timekeeping, will be to encourage knowledge resource sharing on how we could bring progress on this topic further. Uh, so first of all, uh, I welcome all the other participants who joined us in the meantime. I would like to ask those of you who are not speaking at the moment to mute themselves. And I would also be very interested to know who joined our session today. So uh, could you please connect to Slido and answer the following question? Uh, if you could share the next slide, please. Yes, exactly. Which type of stakeholders do you represent? Uh, you need to either scan the QR code that you see on your screens or go to the website slido.com and enter the code, which you can see with the hashtag. And please share with us what is your background? Where, where do you come from? And in the meantime, um, I will also uh, introduce our two Firestarter speakers. Uh, Christina, please, next slide. We will check the results of the poll afterwards. Thank you. So our first Firestarter speaker is Han van der Wevere, Senior Researcher and Project Manager at Vito Energyville and Associate Professor at the Norwegian University of Science and Technology. He is going to address the technical challenge of climate neutrality and present some insights about the importance to combine building retrofit and local renewable energy production with the rollout of fourth generation efficient district heating networks, presenting some case studies in Belgium. And the second fire starter speaker, Marina Galindo Fernandez, uh, is a senior manager at Tilia. Uh, she will highlight the angle of districts and territorial approaches to climate neutrality with some interesting case studies from Spain, Denmark and Germany. So those are our speakers, but uh, let's come back to the Slido. I'm curious to see um, what, where is the majority of our attendees come from. So we have some uh, consultants, uh, uh, research representatives and NGOs. Wonderful. Uh, we don't have so many industry representatives, which is a bit uh, uh, strange <laughs> for this uh, type of event, but maybe people are still uh, joining Slido and uh, sharing with us their background. Okay, so let's move on. Uh, and before handing over to Han, I will say a few words about his background. So uh, he does research and manages projects with a focus on the energy transition of the built environment. These mainly include EU funded smart city projects, the EU smart cities marketplace and assignments by the Flemish government and by Flemish cities, uh, such as the climate action plans for cities of Rousselare and Bruges. He holds a PhD on sustainable urban development and researched and taught sustainable building techniques and sustainable urban design at 
at the engineering faculty of Kyle Leuven. He served as the scientific coordinator of the city uh, project Leuven Climate Neutral 2030. And uh, before his full-time scientific occupation, he combined research and practicing as an architect in Belgium and Spain. Hence the link also with our second fire starter speaker, Marina. Um, Hans' background allowed him to explore the relation between research and practice in particular. So Han, uh, I'm pleased to welcome you uh, and you will have 10 minutes for your fire starter presentation. Please, the floor is yours. Han, please don't forget to unmute yourself. Sorry. So uh, thank you, Aksana. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, and yes, it's a bit daunting to say anything senseful uh, uh, about reaching climate neutrality in 10 minutes, but I will give you a few appetizers. Uh, and so next slide, please. So as Aksana already said, I will focus on a few technical challenges and on a few trade-offs that needs to be made. Uh, first of all, if you look from the uh, city perspective, uh, there is um, a rather simple baseline exercise that shall be happening in every city. And uh, please have the next slide for that. Okay. Uh, and the, the, that is the fact that you need to change something in, in the situation that you see here in front of you. And this at a certain uh, baseline year, uh, in the actual situation, you will have an energy consumption which is often um, a lot into buildings and mobility and depending on the kind of uh, city also in industry. Uh, industry, then we speak uh, not about, um, about uh, ETS sector, but about anything that is outside the ETS. Um, that's on the one hand. On the other hand, any city also has already a certain production level of renewable energy, and that's what you see on the right hand. Now, if you want to be climate neutral on your own territory without imports, then the left column should go down and the right one should go up. Next slide, please. Which means that on the one hand, you need to reduce energy demand in all sectors, buildings, mobility, industry, agriculture, uh, services, uh, and you need to increase renewable production. And then there are several options. Next slide, please. You can have very high ambitions on energy efficiency and allow yourself to uh, have less uh, ambition in the renewable field. Or next slide, please. You can also do the opposite. You can invest less effort into turning uh, into increasing energy efficiency, but uh, mainly bet on uh, drastically increasing uh, renewable energy production. Next slide, please. Now the point is that. Um, from an energy and carbon point of view, um, this image is sufficiently straightforward. When we speak about the investments, then um, there are differences. Um, on the one hand, we know that uh, renewables have become pretty market compatible. And so the business case for those renewables is, uh, generally speaking, quite okay. And this means that investments in there hmm, even if they are ambitious, um, have, have another feasibility than if we look to the energy efficiency side on the left hand. Uh, we know that light retrofit of buildings is already uh, quite expensive, but deep retrofit of buildings is very expensive with very long payback times. Uh, the same for mobility. If you really change completely your mobility infrastructure, if you overhaul it, uh, you build uh, uh, separate lanes for buses, for bikes, you, you ban parking space and so forth, you electrify, that's huge investments. And so the question is, um, for example, uh, how deep shall we go in that retrofit uh, and how much shall we trust that certain technologies will allow us not to do these very uh, difficult and long-term processes? Next slide, please. We have been trying to model this at Vito Energyville uh, in order to know where are the, 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 the trade-off points. Next slide, please. And so we've been looking at uh, nine neighborhoods uh, in Belgium, uh, three urban, three very urban, which are in Belgium virtually the same as urban, and three suburban uh, neighborhoods. Next slide, please. And then we have looked, for example, at the total cost of ownership 
per household, but the total cost for society, not only for the household, so the total envelope of, of investments on a 30 years horizon uh, for different interventions. So in the three columns, you see the three types of uh, urban areas, uh, urban, peri-urban, which is urban and suburban. Um, you see three lines. The upper line is uh, no district heating. Uh, the middle line is uh, high temperature, low cost district heating, 100% connection. And the lower bottom line is 100% um, connection to a low temperature, low cost uh, district heating system. And then every block has three columns, a business as usual scenario, a light retrofit scenario for buildings and a deep retrofit scenario for buildings. Now, I will. there's a lot to learn from this sim simple graph, but I will get you some main points. The first thing is that if you look to business as usual uh, without district heating, you see that with the current prices in 2019, this is a simulation from 2019, with the energy prices at that moment, doing very few or just a light retrofit is one of the cheapest options, which is not such a good message if you think of climate neutrality. But there are two other main points which I want to stress here. Uh, number one, you see that in urban areas, if you have the opportunity to roll out uh, high temperature district heating at low cost of the heat source, then uh, connecting the buildings to that district heating system without any heavy interventions, without deep retrofit, becomes competitive. That's number one, which is interesting. Number two, uh, so in that case, high temperature district heating at a low price, there is no real incentive for deep retrofit. That's conclusion number one. Uh, conclusion number two, if you have a low temperature uh, district heating system and you connect all buildings, then we see that not retrofitting the building or lightly retrofitting the building becomes ex extremely expensive in operational phase. The red blocks are the energy consumption prices, and that has to do with the fact that those buildings that are not prepared for a low temperature heating district system um, need booster heat pumps with electricity that is very expensive in Belgium to uh, be able to heat up the, the, the buildings. And so uh, then you see that um, the case for retrofit becomes important. You see also, of course, that in suburban areas, um, district heating networks are more expensive than in urban areas because the heat demand is lower. Next slide, please. I have already told a few conclusions and at the prices of 2019, there's a kind of carbon lock-in. Um, the, 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 the opportunities for district heating are very much dependent on the context. So uh, heat zoning plans in cities will be something very important. Uh, they are being developed in Belgium, but it's very important that it's decided where district heating networks will be, will be rolled out and where we will rather go to standalone solutions, understand full electric. And so if you have a uh, high temperature, low carbon heat available, then it's a way to very quickly decarbonize. Next slide, please. The problem is that that cheap high temperature heat, waste heat, other heat, uh, is not in sufficient uh, 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 amounts available for the societal heat demand. And so it will be rather the offer that will define what solutions are feasible than the theoretical trade-off. Otherwise, we would not retrofit any buildings and just service them with heat that is cheap and sustainable. So we will have to retrofit buildings because the offer of certain heat is not simply available. Next slide, please. Just to illustrate how important are taxes on energy here, uh, we have been calculating scenarios for building to come to the A level. Uh, and then we have looked at that with the Belgian energy prices and the Dutch energy prices. And you should know that in Belgium, the disproportion between taxes on gas and electricity is very high. That means that tax, taxes on gas are very low and taxes on e electricity are very high. And you see that if we compare to the Dutch situation, which is not so um, um, disproportional, you see that in the left hand columns, we always come to the conclusion that people should reinstall a gas boiler. And if we do the same in the Netherlands with the prices in the Netherlands, then we come to the conclusion that everyone should install a heat pump. So hence the extreme importance of policy initiatives uh, in order to re-steer um, the price signal for certain types of retrofit. Next slide, please. 
We have additional challenges uh, to solve because I was uh, illustrating a situation in 2019. Meanwhile, energy prices have exploded. So the case for deep retrofit, the payback time should implode. But materials prices have also exploded. So actually for the moment, we should start with a whole new range of simulations to understand where we are and it's very unstable. We don't know how the rent will evolve. We have a lot of target groups that cannot pay deep retrofit. Next slide, please. And we have a capacity problem in the building sector. Uh, we have one famous example in Italy with 110% tax credit swap. That was a massive investment uh, of public money, recovery money into retrofit. And one of the side effects was that um, prices were exploding because uh, the offer is too limited. And also uh, companies of doubtful quality were entering the market. Um, so if you are disrupting too quickly uh, the construction market, you also have problems. If you do not address the capacity problems for retrofit, you always have you also will uh, have problems. So there are a few additional challenges on a, on our plates today. Hence, next slide, please. I come back to that scheme, the trade-off. Next slide, please. For the discussion, I would have two questions. Um, can we avoid the expensive operation of building retrofit uh, in the built environment in cities uh, by massively um, counting on renewable uh, and sustainable energy put input, uh, example, uh, for example, by uh, district heating networks? Or are other technologies going to save us? Maybe we develop heat pumps that can provide high temperature heating uh, at a very high efficiency. There are thermodynamic limits, but maybe it can happen. It will break through and we can again avoid those deep retrofits. That's two questions that I already want to launch, uh, and I will let it for here at this moment. Uh, and I think I will hand over to Marina. Thank you very much, Han. Before handing over to Marina, I would like to thank you for uh, for this uh, excellent Firestarter presentation and question. And I would like to invite our participants to start sharing your thoughts uh, about it. You can use the Q&A tab on the right hand side on the screen um, and we will get back to your thoughts or your additional questions during the discussion part of, of this session. Uh, and um, also to have some food for thought, uh, we would like to launch our second poll. So please connect to Slido if you haven't done so yet. If you are already there, please uh, uh, tell us what you think. Um, what are the most important aspects in order to uh, achieve climate neutrality in built environment? Could you please rank them? Uh, in order of importance. So starting from the most important and um, going further down. We will leave this slide poll open during the next presentation so we could discuss the results uh, after Marina's far start the presentation as well. And let me introduce Marina Galindo. So as I said, she is a senior manager at Tilia, a Franco-German service company, mainly working at the local level with cities and utilities in achieving concrete progress in energy transition while improving the performance of urban infrastructure and services. She is an industrial engineer specialized, specialized in energy techniques and holds an MBA in international business administration. She has developed an international career, mainly in the fields of renewable energy and energy efficiency. At Tilia, she works on several energy transition projects in France and Europe, including sustainable district heating and cooling, multi-energy smart grids and energy efficiency projects at local, national and EU levels. Since 2016, she has worked on several studies for the European Commission on the role of DHC district heating and cooling in reaching EU energy and climate targets, showcasing best EU practices and providing potential policy recommendations on heating and cooling decarbonization. Uh, those are really interesting studies that I invite you to, to read uh, after you hear Marina's presentation and some uh, excellent examples. So uh, Marina, the floor is yours, uh, Christina, if you could change the slide and you will have 10 minutes for your fire starter. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Asana, and good um, afternoon. 
everyone. Thank you for inviting me to, to this panel. I'd like to share with you a few examples of European cities and communities that decided to decarbonize their territories through efficient district heating and cooling networks. And I am aware that we are in a climate neutrality session, but uh, what we've seen uh, at Cilia in more than 10 year decarbonization uh, projects experience is that uh, in many cases, when we work at city level and districts, um, district heating and cooling is actually one of the optimal solutions and a very powerful uh, decarbonization tool. So um, next slide, please. As um, Aksana mentioned, we've been working for more than uh, five years already with, um, with the Commission, with the Joint Research Center and with uh, DG Ener on um, uh, the key role that uh, efficient district heating and cooling could have in achieving the European goals uh, in climate and, and in energy. So we have published so far two um, studies that um, you you that are available on the web and you will find uh, in the presentation the link a new one is uh, about to be published and um, one of the first things i wanted to uh, discuss today is the current situation of uh, uh, the carbonization of the heating and, and cooling sector because as you know the situation uh, across the different member states is very dif different so we have uh, uh, an average of 23 percent um, renewable um, energy use in heating and cooling. Uh, but we have some top performers uh, in the EU, like uh, uh, mainly in, in in the Scandinavian and Baltic countries, where, with uh, Sweden on the top. And we have all the member states that are, are only using uh, six percent or less than. 10% uh, renewables in our heating and cooling. So maybe one of the things that we could uh, do is look at those uh, countries on the top. And if you have a closer look to these countries, they actually have a very wide um, use of district heating and cooling networks. And these networks are mostly decarbonized. So what we see at the EU level is that uh, even there are many benefits that are agreed between uh, all the scientific community, uh, on the benefits of district heating and cooling as a tool to use local renewable and waste energy sources to have a link to energy efficiency in buildings, as Han was saying, to uh, evolve and introduce new technologies and new energy sources as they uh, appear and as they become more uh, competitive and also to even provide flexibility to the electricity grid. These uh, benefits are still not uh, visible at policy level or not enough and uh, uh, still there is an awareness uh, exercise to to be done around uh, district heating and cooling networks so that's what also we've been doing uh, at eu scale analyzing some uh, of uh, the best examples uh, in different eu communities so if we go to the next slide please we can have a, a next uh, an overview on the 18 case studies that we analyzed in the last two um, uh, reports that we did for, for the commission last year. So you can see that uh, uh, we analyzed uh, different kind of uh, district heating and cooling grids. Uh, some of them are only district heating, some of them uh, provide heating and cooling. All of them are mostly decarbonized. So there is a column with uh, renewable energy shares. So you can see that we have up to uh, 90, even 100 percent of the uh, low carbon fuels used. Different sizes, different uh, uh, geographical uh, areas. And uh, one of the um, key messages here is also that uh, the, the panel of uh, low carbon fuels that can be used by district and cooling is, is very wide. So um, even if it's quite small in the in in the screen, in terms of renewable energy, we are not talking anymore only about biomass, but there's also renewable electricity, there's solar, there's geothermal energy, uh, there's biogas. Um, when we talk about waste heat, it's not anymore only waste to energy. We also have industrial waste heat. We have waste heat from data centers, from wastewater utilities, from um, cogeneration plants and, and power facilities, laboratories, uh, and the use of these low carbon fuels can be even optimized as we add some uh, thermal storage. So that's uh, 
one of the things that we illustrate through very concrete uh, examples uh, in these reports. And I will show you a few examples uh, a little bit later. So next slide, please. I will go very quickly through some of the conclusions of um, the case study analysis that we uh, were, we tried to answer the question on how can we use more uh, renew local renewable energies and waste energy sources uh, through district heating and cooling networks. And we identified five key pillars for doing so. So the first one is to implement a comprehensive and current set of policies, and this is easy to say and more difficult to actually do because uh, when it comes to heating, there are local uh, policies, national, regional, and then there are many parties involved. So making sure you align all the interest to the carbon, to, to be, make sure that the, the investment case for decarbonization is there uh, is a challenge. There are numerous barriers, and this includes also financial. Uh, barriers that uh, can be addressed through well-targeted financial support. The second key success factor that we found in these uh, best practices examples uh, were putting in place a participative governance. So municipalities have a key role to play in this, but we see also that the uh, uh, new forms of public-private cooperation can be done and that actually private sector can also um, support those uh, municipalities and empower them to make sure that they are able to uh, success in, in the heat planning and the carbonization of the building stock. The third pillar concerns the role that district heating and cooling could play in creating more integrated energy systems. So here heating and planning uh, is key. So being able to understand very deeply how is your demand at district level or city level? Understand what are your options in terms of uh, supply, uh, value the potential synergies between uh, uh, nearby urban infrastructure uh, and also waste heat providers, and uh, making sure that you address the, the nexus between the district heating uh, grid and buildings, as Anne was uh, mentioning. So having this more comprehensive approach to, to energy planning. Next slide, please. The fourth um, pillar is about making the right technology choices, uh, in particular through this heat planning process. And uh, all of this needs to be integrated in a robust, post, uh, in a robust business case that is uh, tailor-made for each situation. And through the different cases, we saw some uh, very innovative uh, business um, cases and business models uh, with innovative tariff structures and innovative participative and governance um, uh, models that could be for sure replicated. Next slide, please. So I want to end my presentation with uh, three examples that I find particularly insightful. The first one uh, is um, how Tarnby in Denmark is approaching natural gas phase out. So um, the, when we talked to the utility in Tarby, uh, it was 2020, so before the current uh, energy crisis, but due to the very high goals, uh, climate goals of uh, Denmark that aim at uh, reducing by 70% uh, CO2 emissions by 2030, uh, the gas phase out was already on the table and is being addressed through cheap uh, planning. So they, have the advantage of being uh, uh, very familiar with heat planning. It is mandatory in, in Denmark since the 80s, but uh, now they are applying these methods to natural gas phase out and how they're doing it. So they are basically district by district evaluating what are the options for phasing out gas. So it's mainly joining or connecting the building to the uh, efficient district heating and cooling grid that is in place that has a uh, 91% uh, use of uh, uh, zero emission uh, energy sources. So this is basically the dense areas nearby the existing grid. The second option for those uh, where the connection is not viable is to uh, switch to heat pumps and to a minor extent, in, especially for industries, uh, local biogas can be also used to substitute natural gas. Um, something that uh, uh, 
had to be done or a new innovative uh, way to approach in this uh, challenge was to integrate the electricity DSO on the process. So it was usually done between uh, the municipality, district heating operator and gas operator, and uh, now the electricity uh, district uh, distribution system operator comes also uh, on, on the table. And in Denmark, there was also a compensation uh, for the gas utility uh, that was uh, provided. So I think this is um, interesting to, to look at when we face the natural gas phase out in, in other cities and other countries. Next slide, please. So here we have the case of uh, Querford in, in Denmark, um, oh, sorry, in Germany, um, rural community of uh, 10,000 inhabitants and in it's actually a project where Tilia, my company, and my German colleagues uh, worked at. And, and here, the problem that the community had in 2009 was uh, a very inefficient uh, fossil fuel-based uh, and expensive district heating network. Uh, so they had the question on how, what, what we do with this. Uh, should we switch it off and then have an alternative solution or do we modernize it? And they asked for external support um, to my company in this case. And the innovation uh, here came through the, the approach and the, for the heat planning. So make, putting local value creation into the equation and um, uh, benchmarking the different options uh, for, for this network, uh, taking this into account. So the final solution integrated the creation of a new biogas cogeneration plant using waste uh, agriculture from um, the local farmers. So uh, the results are quite impressive because they managed to reduce 40% CO2 emission, 30% reduction in the energy bill, and 25% return on equity for the community that was able to use this money for other energy transition projects. So in, in uh, so the, the, this uh, local value creation was at the core of the strategy. And next step, next slide, please. And I'd like to finalize with some uh, Spanish uh, examples. So um, in these cases, um, we have the, the city of Barcelona and the city of um, Aranda del Duero. It's a um, mid-sized uh, city in in Spain. And uh, and here, part of the innovation to, um, uh, was also to introduce this strategy and cooling because in Spain, it's not uh, an infrastructure that has been uh, deployed historically. Actually, the district clima, district heating and cooling grid was the first one in the country in 2004. And, and is today saving Barcelona more than 30,000 tons of CO2 equivalent, which is very big. It's one of the cornerstones of the, its climate strategy and is addressing a very important topic uh, for this decade, which is uh, how to decarbonize the rising needs in space cooling. So in, especially in uh, hot climates or like the Mediterranean, here uh, decarbonizing space, space cooling is, um, is a real challenge and district cooling can uh, can tackle it in a very efficient, uh, cost-efficient uh, manner, and and in this case with 10% uh, cost reduction with respect to the alternative. Um, so I wanted to highlight for the case of Barcelona how district heating and cooling can actually address the cooling demand that uh, is the elephant in the room. And for the case of Aranda del Duero, which is a more um, recent uh, district heating grid in this case, what uh, was pretty innovative was uh, that uh, uh, it is a private initiative because actually the national framework uh, is not very supportive. It's getting better, but uh, the, there is not a culture of district heating in, in Spain. So here we had a private partner taking the, the leadership and putting together all the different stakeholders around, around him implementing in the built environment a new district heating grid using biomass and also with waste heat from a local industry. And this was the first waste heat operation, recovery operation in the whole country. Uh, this waste heat recovery supplies 70% of the, of the grid and allows the city to save 11,000 tons um, 
of CO2 per year. I, I mean, um, once it will be fully developed, that's the, the target. So it's uh, pretty big. So um, just to conclude, um, I try to illustrate through these examples uh, how different cities address the climate uh, neutrality challenge and how likely in the building sector's solution, technical solutions, I think, are, are there. Proven methodologies exist. Also, the funding is available, but uh, probably what is missing from my point of view is the, the awareness in some cases, the political will and uh, the effort to actually create the right a business model and to involve all the parties to make it happen uh, as soon as possible. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Marina, for this uh, comprehensive presentation and also great examples. Uh, I would also like to connect to the example which was uh, mentioned during the plenary session by the speaker Jonas Spangerberg from Sweden, uh, who said that basically in Sweden, the fact of uh, connecting to district heating increases the energy performance of, uh, of, of the buildings uh, without having to do anything. <laughs> so that's, that's a great complementarity of presentations. Thank you. And uh, at this stage, I would like to um, go back to our Slido poll, but if you change the slide to next slide, I hope we will see the results. Um, and once again, Okay, uh, it's not showing the results, but maybe uh, if Christina, you go back to the slide, which was before Marina's presentation, we will see what our audience uh, thinks about uh, the important aspects. Excellent. So we can see uh, that building retrofit comes to at the first place um, in, in order of importance to achieve climate neutrality in the built environment. And second comes technology. So this is a very broad term, technology. We can discuss further what our participants mean by which type of technologies can help us decarbonize the building stock. On the third place, we see business models and financing. Fourth comes legislative and regulatory framework, followed by stakeholder engagement and cooperation. Heat planning comes surprisingly at one of the last places. And capacity of local civil servants didn't get any, <laughs> I understand, or maybe comes at the, at the last place, uh, which is also a bit surprising. Yes, it comes at the last on the last place. Uh, a bit surprising for me um, because we also are engaged in some uh, cities initiatives, supporting them in uh, in their energy transition. And when it comes to implementing um, uh, building retrofit initiatives and projects, uh, as well as efficient heating and cooling networks, one of the barriers that they mention most of the times is the lack of uh, capacity, uh, human resources, and, uh, um, and, and, and people who uh, have the knowledge uh, uh, on what to start with. So this is interesting. I would like to ask our speakers, um, Han and Marina, what is your reaction to, to this ranking? Uh, do you agree with it? Um, what you would prioritize as the main aspect? Han, you can come first. Um, yes, I'm also um, a little bit puzzled so by the the little importance that is is attached to capacity because indeed it's an it's an issue as Marina has been illustrating. Um, for the rest, the the difference is also not astonishing, and um, you you see that uh, okay, building retrofit comes as a main concern, um, but um, um, as I said, the, the trade-off uh, with your heat planning is defining what you will do in, in building retrofit. So it's difficult to say that um, one goes first and another one because they are so much uh, interlinked. And <laughs> this is a bit my, my, my struggling myself with these kind of questions is that uh, it's like a network. And if you lift one node of the network, all the others come also. And so I, I think it's, it's important to address the whole cocktail. And now to say, 
what are the main bottlenecks at, at one day i would say it's it's the business models and finance uh, the other day i would say it's the stakeholder engagement so uh, and maybe it will also differ from context to context uh, exactly that's my I would actually like to invite other participants in this thematic session to slow, uh, to join the Slido poll because I see that we don't have enough uh, answers to be able to to draw uh, conclusions from this poll. But in the meantime, Marina, what are, what is your reaction to this? Well, I'm. I, for instance, um, I really think that technology is there. Uh, for for the building sector, I don't think uh, that's uh, the the key today. Uh, we know that if uh, we know how to retrofit uh, a building, we know how to um, uh, supply uh, the carbonized uh, uh, energy through district heating, through heat pumps, or through biogas in some cases, or through biomass. I mean, there are not so many options, but all of all of them are there. So in what I, from my point of view, uh, the legislative and regulatory framework um, is key. It's important to know who is responsible for what. And uh, I, what I see uh, in some countries, uh, this, uh, for instance, heat planning is not mandatory. I believe that uh, integrated heat planning in all urban planning uh, is a must, and energy planning in, in general, integrating um, climate issues uh, in urban planning is uh, key, especially in, in, um, in dense areas. And, um, and I, I'm also surprised about the, yeah, the last position for uh, the capacity of uh, local civil servants, because uh, actually, yeah, the heat planning process is very technical, it's uh, making also the business model, uh, it's not that easy, and uh, that's actually uh, our role uh, in my company what we when we work with a uh, civil servants so it's not uh, like they are not able to understand uh, how the work is done is maybe that they don't have uh, enough resources that they uh, have not done it before and uh, here uh, for instance the, the private sector or the academia can can for sure help and uh, as uh, han was saying also uh, the the perfect uh, cocktail uh, depends really on the each local situation so we have to address and like for me this is part of the heat planning what is the building stock in this area what are the supply options what is the capacity of the of the local teams what is the the regulatory and legal framework uh, for this specific uh, city or district what, who are the stakeholders and then manage to make the best out of it and then put everything together into a business model that uh, works because uh, uh, in the end there are investments that need to be done. So everything has to uh, be aligned to, to be um, ready to be implemented because this is the ultimate goal. It's not uh, just uh, doing a studies and putting them on the, on the shelves. We really want to, to see those investments happen. Yes, I agree with you, Marina. Thank you so much. And just picking up on the on the topic of heat planning, um, maybe some of you are aware that um, the Commission proposes to revise the energy efficiency directives directive, and one of the changes um, uh, will be uh, a mandatory heat planning for cities with uh, above uh, fifty thousand inhabitants. So this is being proposed. Um, what do you personally think? Think about this threshold. Um, is it is it a, a high threshold that needs to be lowered, probably? Or and what is stopping us from implementing heat planning in all cities, even in, in smaller municipalities? Do you have some interesting examples, Marina? I'm <laughs> referring mm. to you. I, yeah, I can uh, start. Um, I mean, as I was saying, the situation in different countries um, is um, different. So. Uh, if we look at uh, Denmark, uh, all cities uh, 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 are used to heat planning and it doesn't depend on, on the size at all. So for me, this is the ideal case and should be the ultimate uh, goal, like integrating uh, climate um, uh, uh, targets and uh, energy planning in all urban planning. So um, this is the ideal case. Then where this doesn't exist at all, 
I think that uh, having some uh, obligations could help and uh, this could be done progressively. So, uh, of course, larger cities have more resources, so uh, it makes sense to start with the, the, with the bigger cities that have uh, uh, bigger teams uh, and, and also that uh, are, the, are hosting a large majority of the uh, population. Um, so I, I, I think that this could make uh, sense also and it could help especially for countries where this is not the case anymore. Even if uh, everyone should be invited to, all, all cities should be invited to do it. And um, what I think is also important is um, to have in mind also the, the implementation of heat planning. No? So heat planning shouldn't be uh, a, a target per se. So the, the objective is not to have a nice study and uh, everyone agrees on it, but then uh, it really needs to be implemented. And this is something that uh, we've seen here in France uh, where this kind of uh, uh, mandatory climate, uh, it's in, in this case climate strategies, was mandatory for uh, cities of more than 50,000 inhabitants first and then 20,000. But the problem we see is that if these key planning uh, exercises are not done in an operational uh, manner or taking into account the, the actual reality of the city and, and the resources and the uh, financial and human and, and with a clear action plan, uh, the risk is that then uh, nothing happens and that uh, it becomes only an administrative uh, burden on our administrative procedure that doesn't lead to actual investment. So uh, I think uh, in the end, we, we have to keep in mind that the ultimate uh, goal is to have investments uh, being done. And for that, uh, I think it's very important to align the, the, uh, yeah, the, the incentives towards uh, yeah, cost efficient uh, solutions and to those investments to actually happen. Yes, indeed. Here again, the capacity of local civil servants is very important. Um, Han, I wanted to ask you because you helped the cities of Rousselare, Bruges, and, and, and Leuven in their climate uh, and energy plans. Um, did you also um, have to work with, uh, with heat planning? And uh, those cities are uh, maybe a, a slightly smaller. Um, um, yeah. What is your experience? Yeah. Well, well, we, we come to the conclusion that, that heat planning is essential uh, for several reasons. Uh, so Bruges is a city of 120,000 uh, people, live in 100,000, Jerusalem is 60,000, and that's close to the limit of the 50,000. But the one that has really a good uh, district heating network is Rousselaar. Bruges has also one, but the smallest city of 60,000 has really a performance district heating network. I also ignore a little bit why, why the threshold is put there. There is maybe policy reasons. Um, but this heat zoning is really important because if you think of rolling out district heating networks, you don't want uh, everyone in that area to retrofit their homes and put heat pumps. Sorry, that's a waste of energy, money, time and effort. So it's it, the ideal situation is where these things are being coordinated and then the scale doesn't matter because if you have a city of 40,000 inhabitants with maybe 10,000 houses um, and all those 10,000 houses will have all their zooming heat pumps turning all winter and maybe also all summer in certain conditions. I mean, is that an ideal situation? Maybe it's much more efficient than to um, work with collective heat pumps and avoid uh, problems of, of noise, of uh, have better scores on maintenance, uh, scale advantages of any kind of type. So I would say, and I have seen also villages with district heating networks, for example, on the island of Bornholm, again in Denmark, there are also German villages with uh, networks as, as far as I uh, remember. So why, why not in a village? So I would say maybe there are some reasons for the 50,000, but the 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 exercise should be done um, in a localized uh, setting, um, being aware of the local context, and I think it it merits to be done uh, everywhere. And then probably capacity of local authorities to do that is maybe limited. But then one needs to think of pooling resources and maybe yeah install a uh, district heating academy for uh, for a group of. Uh, of, of villages and towns in, in a province or in, an, in a region and, and to, to group the efforts.
Mm -hmm. I see that the results of the poll are changing while we speak, so it's nice to see that uh, uh, with your arguments and with your examples you can influence a little bit the opinion of our audience. Once again, I would like to invite our um, participants to ask questions. You can do so by typing in the Q&A section of this session. So please don't type in the event part, but uh, hover on the session and there you have also a Q&A. Um, otherwise, you can also type in the chat. We will find your question. Um, and now I would like to discuss a little bit technology and innovations that can help achieve um, climate neutrality of the building stock. Uh, Christina, could you please um, uh, go further to the yeah almost last slide? Uh, because we have another question for our audience. And the next slide, please. And here is another slide, poll. So this is a word cloud. Please um, tell us what innovations are needed to decarbonize the EU urban building stock. Uh, was there something that we missed during the discussion or during the presentations of our fire starter speakers? Um, uh, what innovations would you like to propose and what are you working on? And in the meantime, I would also like to ask our speakers. So uh, apart from increasing uh, building energy efficiency and retrofitting buildings. What other technologies can we rely on? Um, so Han mentioned high temperature heat pumps, right? Uh, what are the, uh, the, the challenges of uh, implementing heat pumps everywhere? Because also the European Commission now in the recently published uh, Repower EU plan uh, puts a lot of, of emphasis on the development of heat pumps uh, for the heating purposes. So what could be the bottlenecks of this, um, of this emphasis? I think one of the things that um, Han also mentioned before is to um, uh, work on the um, electricity taxes and, and device, because today there's not really a um, level uh, field between uh, the different heating technologies and um, uh, uh, electricity taxes are in general much higher than uh, gas. Uh, I think the exception is the Netherlands. But um, I think there is a, a work to do in, in terms of uh, energy taxation to um, decrease the level of taxes uh, and device in, in electricity and um, maybe also to value the flexible uh, technologies that exist and in, there are different models of heat pumps but uh, when these heat pumps can also provide um, flexibility to the network uh, this should be valued uh, in the electricity tariffs uh, it's part uh, typically of the um, um, uh, grid uh, uh, the grid part of the electricity tariff and this is uh, not valued in in all the countries uh, or in most of the countries so I think the, there is uh, some work to be done there and uh, I know that for instance in in the case uh, that I presented in Querfurt one of the challenges of the um, district heating grid also was the because they, they wanted to introduce heat pumps in the grid but uh, due to the level of uh, the temperature levels of the connected buildings that was uh, pretty high like so 80 degrees they needed high temperature heat pumps that were not supported by the german uh, support systems uh, so and and today the business model was basically not uh, viable so there's some work to be done to make sure that there is the right uh, price signal to make the investments uh, that we think are the right ones Thank you, Marina. Han, what is your opinion? Yeah, I completely agree. And I said already a lot of uh, things. Um, I think also that um, we, we need to get more hold uh, uh, and model better. Uh, where are, where are, where's the fine tuning? Like what you can do now in, in what is proposed now in the Netherlands, in Belgium, is you do the 50 degrees test. And that means that 
in your home you, you you put your heating installation on a maximum temperature of 50 of, of on 50 or 55 degrees uh, with your classical gas or oil boiler whatsoever and you see if you can heat the home in the coldest period of the winter and if it works then you can more or less decide that it's heat pump ready which is a test and try strategy but we should get better hold of of where the subtle trade-off points are and district heating networks will play a role and but where we don't have them and uh, we need also to know very well uh, how how we decarbonize that part uh, and like for a city uh, like like bruges uh, we, we we came to the conclusion that uh, we should try to roll out the existing he district heating network that is now serving big clients to 25 percent of the territory but 75 percent of the territory is not fit for district heating so yeah we we, we need, probably we need also to think more in uh, in integrated simulation models uh, so that um, certain technologies where we suppose that they cannot be applied uh, can be applied and then uh, the evolving um, heat pump technology but also the evolving input in in district uh, heating networks uh, the lowering temperatures uh, how do you how do you deal with them and until where you can come uh, i think there's yeah a lot a, a lot of need for integrated modeling also Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Well, this is the last chance for our participants to uh, to to say uh, a word uh, on this topic. So please participate in the poll because the results will be then integrated in the summary of this uh, session. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, the next plenary session will already start in two minutes. So I will use these two minutes, remaining minutes to wrap up uh, and to try to formulate some conclusions from these discussions. Sana, there, is a, there is a question from Sirep Talve in the chat. Okay, thank you. Indeed. Is there room for improving heat pumps? Which are the challenges for different heat pump types? Is there room to rise efficiency? Han, do you feel comfortable answering this very specific question? Yeah, I'm, I'm aware of, of one producer in the Netherlands that promises to come up in the summer with a with an, uh, heat pump, which is based on uh, CO2 as a, as a cooling uh, uh, liquid, uh, cooling uh, means. And that would be able to give really high temperatures. But seemingly in the operational part, um, um, a very low uh, retour temperature is needed and so forth. So not all challenges are are solved. There seem to be things moving. As I said, there are thermodynamical limits to the systems, uh, but things are moving and we will have to see in practice if if, if those work, eh? but they come still with some questions. So yes, there is uh, room for improving heat pumps. Um, and, and for the technical details, um, yeah, I'm also looking forward to see new products coming on the market, being tested and then see uh, how they perform. Thank you very much. So I'm afraid we need to wrap up. Uh, just to summarize, we have seen that uh, building renovation should go hand in hand with heating and cooling decarbonization and Han presented some, uh, uh, some, some case studies. Um, Marina also highlighted that district heating networks have a key role to play on this uh, and the EU and national legislation should provide a framework to, pro to promote this efficient technology. And uh, let's not forget that shifting to a district approach rather than looking at the single buildings will help us capture interdependencies between supply and demand and also explore the synergies that can be identified only if a holistic planning to energy takes place. And thank you for this uh, discussion. Thank you for the examples you brought. And uh, yes, we can already move to the plenary session and enjoy the wrap up of the event. Thank you once again, Han, Marina, for your time. Uh, please don't hesitate to share the links to the studies you mentioned in the chat. Otherwise, we will also include them in the summary of this session. Thank you again and see you in the plenary.